Dr. A.B. Gupta holds B.E. from M.R.E.C. Jaipur, M.Tech and Ph.D. Environmental Sciences and Engineering degree from C.E.S.E. I.I.T. Bombay. He joined M.N.I.T. as a lecturer of civil engineering in 1984 and is serving as a professor since 1996. His administrative assignments of M.N.I.T. includes H.O.D. Civil, Dean R&D, Dean Faculty Affairs and Director. He has published over 400 papers in various international national journals, conference, guided 20 PhD and about 100 master theses, taken up several prestigious research consultation projects funded by national international agencies and received many academic research awards. He has been a non-official member of RPCB and Environment and Health Board of Rajasthan and several important committees of DST Government of India. His major research contribution are in the area of biological waste treatment and environment and health linkages that have benefited large segments of the society. Thank you for the nice introduction and uh, as uh, was indicated as uh, what was the purpose of this uh, whole webinar series I would try to confine myself more to the technology part rather than the other parts but uh, just to rope in the whole idea I'll be talking on water supply and sanitation under emergencies. Emergencies could be floods, emergencies could be droughts. And uh, all the thing is uh, revolving around water. Water is the elixir of immortality or Amrit as described by the Atharva Veda. That to see, hear and speak are useless in the absence of water. Water is the basis of life. Most life forms are born in it and live in it. And it says that all oh, water stream come near me, you are the elixir of immortality. But the same elixir now is responsible for a majority of the diseases prevalent in our country. So what has turned this elixir of immortality into the cause of many diseases? We will not uh, talk about the general things, but uh, we will be touching upon mostly the disasters and the water supply systems as well as some sanitation part. So what are the interventions required in emergencies? How do you prioritize the emergency? How do you organize the events in an emergency? And finally, the major portion of the uh, presentation would be on approaches to water purification under emergencies. And just a bit of touch on emergency sanitation. So disasters could be pandemic. It could be a tsunami, earthquake, storms, floods fires, droughts, and in all these cases, there is a direct impact on the water supply and sanitation and hygiene systems, resulting in two more problems post flood or post disaster than during the disaster, because there is insufficient water supply, improper sanitation, your hygiene practices cannot be maintained in the normal way, and then you may have to consume contaminated water. So all these things make the disaster response system to water supply very sensitive because of the destructions to the water supply systems, contamination of groundwater or wells. Then there may be electricity supply being cut off. There may be a collapse of the water distribution network altogether and resulting into failure of supply, the routine supply, and then forced consumption of contaminated water resulting into serious health problems. And just a few observations, uh, some lessons learned from the 100 year return flood at Bangkok in 2011. I was teaching there in 2012 first quarter and they had faced almost two months of submergence under huge water column. And interestingly, every corner of the street, they put up a water ATM where you put up a, a one baht coin and you get one liter of RO water. And not a single case of any infection due to water was reported in the post flood scenario of Bangkok. It was just amazing. In fact, they took many such measures, indoor air and other things, which I will not describe here. Chennai when it underwent a very huge flood, there was a huge difference in the water quality of the wells. 
So in TDS it decreased, but many parameters increased in terms of water quality toxins, and that was a different thing altogether. And Mumbai had a very different case. I remember one of my students ringing me, ringing me up and said, "Sir, you know that I am a short height person, and all my ground floor is fully submerged with water." I'm we both are putting up in the mezzanine. Can I drink this water? Our supplies are closed. So these are different dimensions of post flood scenario in terms of water supply. And I'll be talking on these and some of the technologies that we have developed that also be will be described. Microbiological quality deteriorates significantly, and this effect is felt for a long time after the floods, and that's very very important. And hence the connected thing that is sanitation is also important. Chemical quality of groundwater changes, and some of the changes can be very very difficult to circumvent, like heavy metals or pesticides coming from the surface runoffs during the floods. And hence there is a need for flood proofing of the wells to prevent the contamination. Uh, the effects of uh, disasters on water supply system result into Failure of water supply, consumption of contaminated water being forced, and serious health problems. And we had seen the impacts of Bangkok, Chennai, and Mumbai floods. So, how to manage an emergency? You have to build resilience to enable the rehabilitation. And that is in terms of various interventions for saving lives, easing the suffering, speeding up the process of rehabilitation by specific task force like that of wash where you are providing safe drinking water and sanitation and you have to prioritize the key factors for any emergency like first thing is protection of water as i said flood proofing of the wells second is you have to ensure at, a, at least a bit of water quantity which is essential for life then we can talk about quality and then about its distribution. So if we organize the system under emergencies, we have to talk about both quantity and quality with a certain minimum standards being followed so that at least if the water is not very good, it should be safe. Whether it's a direct supply or the distribution system, demand has to be properly assessed for the specific needs like survival needs, two and a half to three liters, Basic hygiene practice, two to six liters. Cooking practices, three to six liters. So these are the basic needs of water requiring different kinds of quality aspects. And you can have a point of use supply as well as camp water supply, like maybe an installation at the site itself, maybe a simple disinfection system, or maybe a whole treatment plant portable, which are available custom made. So ultimately what happens is we have to ensure the water security, which has various dimensions of water regarding its quantity, quality, the river water, its quality, resilience related to the water related disasters. And now I'll just talk about various technology interventions that we have been carrying out for last more than three decades at MNIT. First and most important linkage of water is with the biological contamination. And in all these disasters, mostly the biological contamination is one of the major reasons. You have to quickly check that it, check the contamination. So quick detection is a key. Once you detect something, it has to be then corrected by a proper disinfection means. We'll be talking about them. And opposite to floods, there are droughts. Like in Rajasthan, we have almost half the time it's a drought year and the water table is going lower and lower people don't call it as a disaster because it's more or less a systematic disaster and over the years since the rainwater has to pass through a huge soil and uh, rock column there is a high concentration of fluoride nitrate arsenic pesticides in the groundwater and that is something dangerous and on top of that, salinity, can you imagine in Rajasthan, I've tested samples with 
24,000 ppm of TDS and people were drinking it. I have tested samples with even 70,000 plus TDS in Ganga Nagar and Mangar, but that was due to water log. Here it's right opposite. Groundwater having very high TDS. 5 to 15,000 is not uncommon in Bharatpur area. So Rajasthan is giving 35,000 villages for their daily drinking water consumption, the RO water. There are 35,000, uh, 3,500 villages, I'm sorry, which are receiving RO water for drinking daily purpose. Sorry for this sound, but this was the only slide with some audio. Human being is the biggest enemy of human being. On the left hand side, you see various kinds of organisms, some bacteria, some viruses, some amoeba, higher organisms. They are excreted by humans per gram of human species into millions and billions. And once they enter the soil streams, they can survive for anything between a month to a year. And that shows the proof of one of my earlier statements that post flood contamination prevails for a long time. So you have to, first of all, make good methods for quick detection. So the common ones in India till date are H2S strip or maybe a full test being carried out in the laboratory. We took a new equipment called Collilert. It's a US patent. It's for enumeration of coliforms. This required four and a half lakh rupees of investment. There is a tray, 250 rupees. It is sealed so you remove the tape put 100 ml of water which is to be assessed and put a media sachet of 900 rupees into it seal it here and then after 18 hours you can count the number of yellow wells to get the coliform counts so presence absence and counts these are the two things we developed this medium rather than 900 rupees or less than nine rupees and we thought of converting the h2s strip with a better while. So same concepts. The only thing is a very different media and very different set of bacteria being used for indicating the coliforms. So we use certain enzyme reactions. And this H2S strip, you have to put 20 ml of water. And if it turns dark after 36 to 48 hours, then the water is contaminated. Now it's a huge time, 36 to 48 hours. By then, thousands of people might be and uh, I mean affected, infected. So we have developed this Collipad kit, not a single PESA extra. It is able to detect within eight to 10 hours. And this, while this H2S strips requires at least 20 to 30 coliform per 100 ml of contamination level, we can detect two to three coliforms. So one tenth of contamination detected in one third of time without adding any cost. And then we thought of making a enumeration kit also. Now imagine 250 uh, rupee uh, this tray was converted to a ELISA tray, 70 rupees in the market. We do not need any sealer now because we have put a 20 rupee rubber cap on this tray and used our medium. So medium is costing 100 times less. Tray and cover for 90 rupees, not 250 rupees, and no sealer required. So this is, now we are extending it for many emerging pathogens, and especially of nosocomial origin. Hospital related contaminants are of high concern these days, and we'll not talk into more details right now. Now sewage now, nowadays is used for agriculture purposes extensively across our country. Earlier we used to have disposal standards, now we have recycle standards. So you have to have stricter standards. And why I'm putting it here is, I'll be relating it to the disasters. In our MNIT campus, which is the greenest campus of the city, we are maintaining these greens entirely on treated sewage. We have two MBBRs and one RBC. And in our Jaipur city, I put up a proposal about 12 years back. And three major, four major public gardens are entirely on treated sewage. 
because it talks, it takes much sense, it makes much sense than a centralized system at a distant STP and bringing the sewage back. And the cost economics are here, you can see it at leisure. But we are developing more such systems which are having greater resilience, like this is a deep wetland. It's installed in Dharamshala by one of my old students. He's doing a wonderful work. And now we are designing deep wetlands. You can imagine a wetland which was having a major problem of high surface area requirement. We have reduced the area requirement by half. No compromise with organics removal. Better nitrogen removal, better phosphorus removal, better sulfate removal, and better, better antibiotic resistance removal. So we are working on disinfection from all these systems. And what we found was chlorine alone is not sufficient. UV alone is not sufficient. There's so many bacteria that go into the system which cannot be removed by a single of these disinfectants. So in the emergency conditions, when we people put some UV based system or chlorine based system, they're not enough. We have developed a hybrid technology where UV chlorine followed by UV is doing wonderful works. It makes economic sense and it. It removes the bacteria, damages the cell irreversibly. Otherwise, after chlorination, there are a lot of pathogens that come back, they regrow, and we have given a new concept of effective reduction, which has been published in a very high rank journal, and people are asking us for more details. So we are talking about improving this hybrid disinfection system for many other things. It, is a, it has resulted into reduction in trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids. It has resulted into better antibiotic resistance removal. We have carried out extensive metagenomics, but I'm just telling you during these conditions, we have to be very careful to provide the right kind of disinfection system. Now, the other extreme of the uh, disaster, that is droughts. Frequent, frequent uh, droughts in Rajasthan have resulted into such a situation that when government of India brought a new mandate under National Rural Drinking Water Program mission that everyone has to be provided with eight liters of water a day that meets the minimum water quality requirements as per BIS 10,500. You know, a change in policy resulted into overnight reduction of rural water supply coverage in Rajasthan from 98% to 54% because the rest 44% was not able to meet either problems of fluoride or nitrate or salinity. And that became a big, big problem. Rajasthan under Rajasthan integrated fluorosis mitigation program over the last 15 years has put up thousands of defluoridation plants in villages and now 3,500 plants, RO plants in as many villages in due to high salinity. So I'll just talk about these three quickly. These are common pictures in Rajasthan. This child is just 38 kilometers from my institution. You can see the severity of dental fluorosis. The whole enamel is gone. This is from the same Raipuria village. Person suffering from multiple deformities, deformation of leg bones, hand bones, chest bone, and a lot of things I can say about him, but not here because it's a compact lecture of 45 minutes. When I saw this nine year old Bina from the same Raipuria with hunchback, first time a nine year old was deciphered with hunchback due to fluorosis. Earlier, 35 plus only were reported to have such a manifestation. So this was sometime in 1990 we took this picture and we are first ones to have treated fluorosis patients with oral medicines. So it is written as irreversible in the medical books. So many of the stains could be removed. And a lot of calcium which was leached out due to fluoride was resorbed by controlled doses of calcium, vitamin C and vitamin D. And that became a procedure, but that is not sufficient because medical uh, requirements are long time and then the partial impact only is seen among the patients. So better thing is defluoridation methods. So those days 
Nalgonda and activity delamine are the two major methods. In Nalgonda method, you have to put some lime and alum from this table, which is based on fluoride and alkalinity of the raw water. Put it here, stir it for 10 minutes, allow it to settle for half an hour. Then this defluorinated water can be used. When we started doing research on it, we found it awful, absolutely. You are removing fluoride and introducing aluminum, which was six, 10 to 60 times higher than the allowed limit. And aluminum is a osteotoxin like fluoride, means problem with the bones, and it's a neurotoxin as well. And we have worked in about 120 villages. We have shown how nalgot, I mean, treated water can result into aggravation of osteotoxicity and even initiation of neurotoxicity through all our chemical chemistry being assessed. And now we have modified the Nalgonda in a form by replacing alum with PACL. We have synthesized many PACLs which are giving very, very good results. And we have made household devices as well which are doing very, very well in the field. But ultimately, and the second uh, major technology was activated alumina. Earlier, we were working on household systems. But when this is fully consumed, it has to be regenerated. And when the villager would take this unit to the central facility for regeneration, and if he or she uh, looks at the regeneration procedure, which involved concentrated acids and alkali, they would run back without taking the unit. So ultimately, community-based plants were put up. Now there are thousands of them, and they're doing fa fairly well. So we approved activated alumina technology. Last 16 years, only Rajasthan has banned Nalgonda. Activated alumina was the only thing approved by us initially. Then another technology was approved by us called BioApp, which has a hydroxy appetite based adsorption. They were importing HAP from Australia. Now we have we are making it at 50 times lesser cost from marble slurry, which is a waste in Rajasthan. So this is what is needed. And we synthesized new PACLs and made these domestic units, which will be put under trial probably by next month. Arsenic problem is in West Bengal and Assam areas and Bihar areas, some of the areas, and things are extremely bad. The only thing why I've shown it here, I've not worked on arsenic, though arsenicosis, yes, I have seen certain data and handled them, but arsenic and uh, uh, removal and defluoridation can be combined, and that is what we are attempting in Assam now. Nitrate toxicity, as against the standards of 45 in Rajasthan, I have tested samples with up to 2,500 ppm of nitrates and people are drinking it. When you ingest high nitrate water, nitrate is not toxic, but for some reason, if it reduces to nitrite, nitrite joins with hemoglobin to make methemoglobin. Now, methemoglobin has 50 times lesser capacity to carry oxygen. So body will not get enough oxygen. First sign is turning the skin blue. It was found in infants up to nine months. So it was called infantile methemoglobinemia or blue baby's disease. And 1987, when I started making certain hypotheses, and I was examined by some doctors for my hypothesis. First, they laughed at me, but thereafter, after our interventions in villages, we changed the whole scenario. The infant mortalities reduced to less than a third. And I'll only describe one thing. All these papers are called as breakthrough papers for medical sciences, but recurrent diarrhea. What I found was 425 ppm plus nitrate can initiate diarrhea. Now imagine a child being given some milk with water which had a very high nitrate. The diarrhea starts not because of bacterial contamination or viral contamination or amoebic contamination. It is due to a chemical contamination. The child suffers from diarrhea. In diarrhea, you give ORS. That means now high nitrate containing water directly that to in large quantity to save the child from dehydration. So the child used to die of methemoglobinemia. It was misdiagnosed as diarrheal death because this was the first time in medical sciences we reported how diarrhea can be initiated 
by 4, 425 ppm plus nitrate. And we were working in Paladi village, Jaipur Alwar border, and many more villages where a family was losing on an average one child per year. And the whole village did not, uh, we, I mean, the whole village had more than 40% married ladies who had lost at least one or more children within the first year of its birth. And after our interventions, the infant mortality dropped down because we said up to one year in no form local water should be given. And if the child suffers from diarrhea, use bottled water for making the ORS. But now RO systems have come wherever nitrate is more than 100. So my problem is relieved to a good extent. Many more contaminants like heavy metals, pesticides, like in Punjab, cancer patients are large in numbers. And there are two major reasons ascribed for it, pesticides and radioactivity. There's a train from Punjab that goes to Bikaner, carrying 35, 40 patients of cancer every day. Presence of endocrine disrupting substances, personal care, pharmaceutical products. These are terrible. And though right now we have started making standards for them, there is no technology which can cater to all these pollutants put together. So ultimately it comes to the RO plants, which can be scaled up from a small one to very big one. And as I was telling you, we have assessed 200 RO plants in different villages of Rajasthan. And I'll just show you some of the things. Fouling was a major problem. Now seawater has 35,000 to 40,000 ppm of salinity. Here in our villages, it was typically 2,000 to 15 or 16,000, but fouling was much, much more. The membranes indicated hardly one year of life instead of five, six years, which is observed with seawater desalination. And because groundwater had a lot of calcium and magnesium, carbonates and sulfates, it had a lot of silica, it had a lot of iron and manganese as well. And we started doing our works, trying to understand the systems, and we have brought many new things to the... Uh, we have... I think... Let me just escape. We have brought many new things to the howling tendencies and we have designed new anti scalants now we have been able to increase the membrane life to about three years you you need such simple things to be brought under emergency systems so manually operated nano or RO plants or then water atms to be put at regular distances along the flood prone areas so that post flood infections can be reduced significantly. There will be some issues on reject management and we are trying to tackle it in many other ways. Just a couple of things using solar based VMD, vacuum membrane distillation. We are extracting good water from RO reject at lesser cost than that of RO. And this can be easily used for flushing because even up to almost six gram per liter of sewage of salt being added to sewage its the biodegradation does not get affected adversely and that is uh, our paper there is no such paper available elsewhere because we always thought that chloride was inhibitory for sewage biodegradation but it is inhibitory after a long distance of six gram per liter to be added that means RO reject, we are attaching it with hand pump overflow and septic tank effluent for combined treatment in a wetland. And I showed you the wetland, septic tanks, everyone knows. RO reject is to be put into that. Hand pump overflow is a very common feature in every school of Rajasthan. And every no school has any green belt, so we are putting up wetlands, which will help a lot to reduce the drought prone uh, uh, potential of those areas. And sanitation is more than preventing, just providing some toilets. Nowadays, fully automated systems like this are available. And sometimes so-called high-end technology is safer for use 
in camps used for emergency shelters because they will not result into any contamination of groundwater table which is already high now and that is very very important. same thing is with the sludge very small systems from 2 and 1/2 kg to 200 kg a day systems are available so all the sludge can be dewatered and sent to a distant place so that there is no contamination in the flood prone zone which has a relatively high water table so that was all in terms of some of the technology interventions that we have done quick detection of contamination more accurate detection of contamination then preventing chemical contaminants from affecting your health and then right kind of disinfection system to be developed in order to prevent infection to summarize so that is all from my side thank you so much